about. Please join me in welcoming the mayor of the great city of New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu. Hey everybody, how you doing? It's nice to see you. Thank you all for having us. I appreciate seeing all of my friends who I've known for many, many years. I, I do want to begin by just recalling and keeping in mind our dear friend Ed Anderson, who is in tough uh, circumstances right now. I know that all of you have been following him. Ed has been a dear friend for a very, very long time, and I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that he's not doing well. Um, but let's just keep him in our prayers as, uh, as we go forward. Uh, I thank all of you for having me. Um, as we move into further into 2015, and now that the legislature is in full swing, uh, I think it's important always in the middle of a storm to, to pause, to take a breath, and just for a moment to reflect about uh, the choices that we make and the consequences uh, that follow. In the years just past, we have seen the good, we've seen the bad, We've seen the ugly, uh, our country, our state, and of course the city of New Orleans has suffered tremendously uh, in our recent past. Last week, of course, we celebrated the fifth anniversary of the BP oil spill. Uh, on that day, we lost 11 of our brothers, our fellow citizens, uh, and have since suffered uh, catastrophic economic and environmental consequences from uh, the largest oil spill uh, in American history. Uh, in August, we're going to commemorate the 10th anniversary of Katrina and Rita that threatened so many of our communities. We lost 1,800 uh, of our brothers and sisters, over a million citizens were displaced across the Gulf Coast. Uh, the city of New Orleans was underwater, uh, as were a lot of the other metropolitan areas of New Orleans and southwest Louisiana. But because of the great sacrifice of so many people, a lot of hard work, because we are an exceptional people, we are tough, we're resilient, we're strong, we will be able to celebrate and we will be able to talk about how we overcame uh, the difficult circumstances that we were in and we will be able to talk about how far we have come. But what really matters now is how we move forward together. For our part today in New Orleans, uh, I'm proud to say that New Orleans is on a roll. All you have to do is think about this weekend. Jazz Fest was rocking. The Zurich Classic was in town. A Navy Week was in New Orleans, 3,000 of our great soldiers uh, were there celebrating with us. You couldn't walk anywhere uh, in the city and not feel the joy uh, and the wonderfulness of the soul of America, whether it was Tony Bennett, Lady Gaga, or The Who, uh, John Legend, Irma Thomas, Jimmy Buffett, the best in the world uh, is operating at the highest level in our city. And I can honestly say that for the city of New Orleans, our greatest days are ahead. So it's worth taking a minute and ask the question, how did we do that? How did we go from being literally underwater to one of the fastest growing cities in America with thousands of new jobs, new industries, rapidly improving schools, rising property values, and rebuilding that is moving at a breakneck pace? Well, I'll tell you, it took a lot of discipline, it took a lot of hard work, it took determination, it took commitment, and all wrapped together, it is an approach that I call the New New Orleans Way. The New New Orleans Way means being principled, but practical, focused on making government work for the people. After all, there is no ideology to filling a pothole, fixing a street light, opening a playground, putting a gas in a police car, or responding to a fire. The New New Orleans Way means the government has to be honest, it has to be lean, it has to be effective, it has to be efficient, it has to be entrepreneurial. It basically has to do whatever it takes to cut smart, reorganize, and invest in what matters most. The new New Orleans way means if we cannot find a way, we will work together to make one. Everyone has to be at the table, local, state, federal officials, Faith-based leaders, the private sector, the not-for-profits, the neighborhood associations, everyone has to be at the table sharing the sacrifice, sharing the risk, and sharing the reward. And we cannot leave anybody behind. <laughs> but here's the most important thing about the new New Orleans way. In our city, we say talk is cheap. 
It's not just about what to do, but how to do it. We have to find a way to make big ideas hit the street. So since 2010, we've been putting the new New Orleans way into practice. This has not been easy. As a city, we have had to make some tough decisions that hurt really badly. Zero sum decisions. In some instances, impossible choices between bad and worse. Choices like furlough every city employee or don't make payroll. Choices like stop hiring police officers or go bankrupt. Choices like increasing a fee for garbage <coughs> collection or maintaining a structural deficit. All of these decisions between bad and, as we like to say on Prius Street, the more bad. And we've done it all the New Orleans way to try to move forward on a more sound financial footing. But five years ago, when I took office, the city's finances were in really bad shape. We had a $100 million hole in our budget. That's 20% of our approximately $500 million budget. And we were spending $5 for every $4 that we took in. Indeed, the city's budget had a massive structural deficit where every year the city would start well below water. Then to make ends meet, the city, the city historically robbed Peter to pay Paul, use one-time money for recurring expenses, not unlike what's happening in the state right now, today as we speak. In New Orleans, this was a long-standing condition, but in 2010, right before I took office, the bill had finally come due. $300 million in loans was gone, our savings accounts were drained, and if things had kept going the way they were, the New Orleans Police Department would have literally been out of money in 90 to 120 days by October of the year that I took office, five months after May 5th when I was sworn in. That would have meant absolutely no paychecks for police on the streets of New Orleans, no public safety anywhere. At that moment in 2010, New Orleans was much like Detroit. It was a city on the verge of bankruptcy. If we had gone over that cliff, business would have headed for the hills, the recovery would have come to a halt, and a judge could have seized control of our city and unilaterally ordered brutal cuts for police, for the fire department, for sanitation, for roads, and all other city services. We avoided this fate through the new New Orleans way and to date, we have kept our freedom. But here's the thing for people to understand. Freedom is not free. It took sacrifice, it took sweat, it took tears to balance the budget, going from deficit to surplus over the past five years. And here's how we did it. We used every tool that was available to either find a way or to make one. The first thing that we did, because we had to, is we had to cut the government. We were spending too much. And ladies and gentlemen, we cut very aggressively. It was pretty simple. We were spending more than we took in. So we cut a lot. But we cut smart. It's like when you're trying to lose weight. You're trying to shed 20 pounds. Lots of ways to do it. You could do it by having somebody cut off both of your arms and then bleed the patient to death. That's not a smart cut. Instead, you diet, you exercise, you make lifestyle changes, you work harder, and cutting smart can have a dramatic effect and make you better. Not cutting smart can make you worse. The next thing we did is we went to work, reducing waste, fraud, duplication, and excess by reorganizing the government of New Orleans. We froze hiring. We negotiated, renegotiated millions of contracts. We reorganized departments, boards, and commissions to save money. We stopped doing things that the private sector or not-for-profits could take over. For example, we actually eliminated 60 jobs in the health department that the clinics in and around New Orleans are now taking care of because they could do that better than us. We reformed city contracting. Now in New Orleans, it's not what you know, it's not who you know, it's what you know. Then we got, we saved, what we saved, we invested in the top citizens' priorities and engines of growth like the public-private New Orleans Business Alliance and One Stop Shop for permitting. Now the New Orleans is a much better place to do business than it was five years ago. That's self-evident. You can come to New Orleans now and see the number of businesses that are opening up 71 retail shops alone in the last couple of years. It was, and it still continues to be, very painful. We have the scars to prove it. But you know what? We're not finished yet. We still have a long way to go. But it's clear that we are well on our way. But here's the point. We pulled the city out of a fiscal death spiral and simultaneously 
started a new virtuous cycle where success breeds success. Better city services, more jobs, more retail sales, more restaurants, rising property values, and more revenues that can be reinvested in citizens' priorities. Our number one priority, like hiring more police officers. During my administration, we put five recruit classes on the streets, and one recruit class has already graduated this year. Another class is in session now, and four more are budgeted for this year. Priorities like fighting blight. We're putting thousands of properties back into Congress, over 10,000 blighted <laughs> units fixed up or torn down during our first term faster than anywhere else in the country. Priorities like repairing streetlights. In 2010, when I got there, about one in every three streetlights were dark. Now we've got 97% of our streetlights working, the most since before Katrina, and 75% have been converted to energy efficient, brighter, longer lasting LEDs. This is what we do. This is our governing philosophy. We try to bring people together. We try to make tough decisions. We cut, we reorganize, and then we invest in the people's top priorities. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that we're not perfect. We're far from it. We've made a lot of mistakes, and we have a long way to go. For example, we still have the police consent decree, the sheriff's consent decree, the firefighters' pension fund, decaying streets, and a whole assortment of long, a long-standing problems that we are now confronting and slowly making our way through. But we have clearly, clearly turned ourselves around. We're getting things done, and people are taking notice. The Wall Street Journal's Market Watch ranked us number one for the most improved city for business in, two, in 2011. And Forbes says that New Orleans is America's biggest brain magnet. Bloomberg News wrote, we are a top American boomtown, and the National Journal labeled us the Cajun comeback. They're a little bit geographically challenged, but <laughs> you gotta let them go on that. Even our Secretary of Economic Development, Secretary Steve Moray, said, the same thing. He called New Orleans the greatest comeback city of the 21st century and one of the hottest places to do business in the country. Now, that's all great stuff to hear. It really is. It makes me feel really good. And the people of New Orleans and the people of Louisiana should be proud. But now the question is, will our hard work be worth anything? Can we keep going? Can we, consist can we sustain it? There is an old but very true saying that as New Orleans goes, so goes the state of Louisiana. But it is also true, and I learned this really clearly when I was a lieutenant governor, that as the state goes, so goes the city of New Orleans. We are bound together. Our fates are inextricably linked. We're partners, and that's really why I'm here today. I, I want to uh, talk a little bit about a couple of things, because despite all of our successes, we are having, unfortunately, uh, the story at the state level becoming basically the opposite of what has happened uh, in New Orleans. And it is keeping us in New Orleans from reaching our full potential, and consequently, the state of Louisiana. Instead of getting stuck with a mid-year $100 million shortfall, which represented 20% of our budget like we did, Governor Blanco left this state with a $1 billion surplus. The state rainy day fund was full, and the other state trust funds were flush with billions in cash earmarked for top priorities like schools, infrastructure, economic development, higher education, coastal restoration, and health care. Indeed, in 2008, when the economic crisis hit every other part of this country and everyone was sucking wind, Louisiana was not. Our finances were stable, and with construction boom coming our way, bolstered by federal recovery and insurance dollars, we were in fact poised at that moment to leapfrog the competition. We could have moved forward with the confidence that we're using with the New Orleans way. We could have taken on the tough issue of tax reform, reducing exemptions and lowering overall tax rates. We could have reorganized our higher education system, cut waste, save millions, and then double down on job training and our statewide network of community and technical colleges. And in every corner of the state, we would have built a highly skilled workforce to attract more business and better jobs. We'd be better poised to compete in a 21st century knowledge-based global economy if we had done that. We could have used our carefully saved pennies to expand priority programs like petroleum engineering at UL Lafayette and pharmacy at UL Monroe, while also launching LSU into the top 10. 
We could have brought everybody together <coughs> to start the process of restoring the coast. We could have said we won't leave anybody behind and done something about rising income inequality. We could have done something about uh, out of control spending for corrections, which has gone from $442 million to $750 million today. Indeed, across the country, there is a growing bipartisan and strong chorus speaking out against mass incarceration. And Louisiana is the poster boy for this national problem. We imprison more people than anywhere else, and what do we have to show for it? About half of the inmates returned to prison within five years because they committed another crime, and Louisiana's crime rate is still 35% higher than the national average. We need to be tough, and we need to be smart on crime. In this regard, New Orleans is already leading the way, and we're moving forward. We have cut our prison population by one-third, but we are still the most incarcerated city, in the most incarcerated state, in the most incarcerated country in the world. We can do better and we can be safer. And as I said, there is a strong bipartisan coalition forming across this country to address this very serious issue. We could have invested in things like mental health, which prevents all sorts of other more expensive problems, from homelessness to crime. Small front-end investments with big-time savings on the back end. We could have invested in universal pre-K so every parent of a three or four-year-old would have access to high-quality, enriching education and equal opportunity to achieve their dreams. We could have invested in roads and bridges, built out I-49, fixed the bridge at Lake Charles, or started to knock down the rest of the state's current $12 billion roads infrastructure backlog. But instead, we have gone in the exact opposite direction. I don't say this really to look backward or to point fingers. I say this so that we can learn about what we're supposed to do going forward. The philosophy of the last eight years has been very, very clear, and it has been very, very simple. Cut taxes at all costs, never, ever, ever raise one. Give away the farm, put everything on the credit card, spend recklessly, cut mindlessly, put off tough decisions, and pray the economy grows you out of having to live within your means. And try to divide and conquer on the wedge issues that attempt to distract us. And it has succeeded exactly as it was intended. So let's consider just for a moment how this all has worked out for the people of Louisiana. From a $1 billion surplus, we now have a $1.6 million deficit, plus billions of dollars in taxpayer trust fund money saved over a generation has been spent in a very few short years. It is nearly all gone, used to plug holes in a budget. We have drained the marrow from our bones, hoping that no one will notice. But bones with no marrow are brittle and they're weak. And it's only a matter of time before they break for the whole world to see. Right now, the situation in Baton Rouge is very similar to the mess that we found in New Orleans five years ago. But here's the thing, it's actually worse. So in 2015, the state should come together, all right, the new New Orleans way, to find common ground. You gotta take on the tough problems. You gotta cut, reorganize government. You have to invest the savings. You have to do it all. Use every tool that's available. Do not be afraid. No sacred cows, no gimmicks, and it's gotta actually work. Now, this reminds me of one of my favorite jokes about Thibodeau and Boudreau, that for some reason got tired of hunting ducks and decided to go to Canada to shoot some moose. They got this little plane, they flew up there, and would you know it, that Thibodeau and Boudreau actually shot six moose? Go figure. They dragged them back to the plane and tried to start loading them on the plane. And their pilot said, no, 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 boys, this plane doesn't take six moose. That's too many. Thibodeau and Boudreau got irate and said, well, last year we came hunting. Last year we shot six moose. Last year we put the moose on this plane. And the pilot thought, well, maybe they know more than me. So he acquiesced. They load the six moose on the plane. The plane takes off. It crashes immediately. Thibodeau and Boudreau are laying on top of each other and on top of all six moose. And Thibodeau says to Boudreau, he says, T. Boudreau, you know where we at? He says, yeah, we the same place we were last year when we crashed. <laughs> he didn't like that joke. <laughs> the point should be obvious. If we keep doing the same thing, 
we're going to end up in the same place, and we should expect the same outcomes. So the truth is, by and large, all that's been proposed for this session seem to be short-term solutions that spend money today that should be saved for tomorrow. Band-Aids on an infection that actually needs pretty radical surgery. And some things that have been proposed, like repealing the inventory tax in isolation, with nothing to replace it with, outside of the context of overall tax reform, would actually cause more problems than it's going to solve. Not to mention that fiscal experts now say that it, even, it doesn't even do anything to fix next year's $1.6 million deficit. Indeed, if the legislature decides to abolish the inventory tax with nothing to replace it with, property owners on the local level will see huge in taxes, huge increases in taxes across Louisiana. Local governments are going to lose millions more and will not be able to provide even basic services like trash pickup, police, and fire in some parishes. It's estimated that 2,700 local teachers would lose their jobs. From there, just in St. James Parish, they may lose, the sheriff could lose 40% of his budget and the levy districts, those that are providing coastal protection to us in the river region, could lose roughly 36% of their revenue. In New Orleans alone, the inventory tax means $11 billion to our bottom line, a severe threat to our ability to fund public safety. The medicine, as I said before, should never ever be worse than the disease. There are other, better ways to raise this revenue that make more sense, that have broad support, and don't create problems. The question is, what is the plan to get out of the mess that we're in, short term and long term? Frankly, this isn't rocket science. And with 22 years of experience at the Capitol, 16 years as a legislator, six as a lieutenant governor, and after dealing with what we've done in New Orleans, the way forward to me seems pretty obvious, although it's hard. The biggest problem facing our leaders today is the governor has set up a false choice where we must either destroy higher education, crush business, or undermine local government's fiscal stability. There are other options, and if we're not beholden to Grover Norquist and the Americans for tax reform, this should be pretty simple. First and foremost, we have to undo the harm that was done. Go back to the 2008 tax structure. If you don't like that because it upsets you, give a serious look at the proposals forwarded by Dr. Jim Richardson and his colleagues, lower exemptions, flatten the income tax, stabilize the sources that come in. Secondly, bring the cigarette tax to the national average, which would raise about $230 million per year and would change behavior and save lives. One of you guys, Jeff Benson, wrote this. The fact is that more than 7,200 adults die each year and 98,000 youth now under 18 will ultimately die prematurely from smoking in Louisiana. But increasing the tax means that we can have major public health impact and save lives. Here are some of the other statistics. 43,000 current adult smokers would quit. 22,300 fewer premature deaths from smoking in Louisiana. 17.9% decrease in youth smoking. 1.4% $8 billion saved in long-term health care costs, and as mentioned earlier, $223.5 million in annual revenue to off offset the smoking cost just in Louisiana. Conservative Republicans from around the country have joined this chorus a long, long time ago, beginning with Haley Barber, who used to be the head of the Republican National Committee. It's good public policy. It makes sense. Another $240 million could be saved by getting rid of the decades-old tax exemptions for horizontal drilling that even some big-time supporters of the oil and gas industry recognize as no longer necessary. Just the cigarette tax and the horizontal drilling exemption alone could save about the same amount as repealing the inventory tax, and it won't hurt the middle class, and it won't hurt public safety. From there, the next and the most obvious is Medicaid expansion, which not only would provide health care to 360,000 Louisiana citizens, but also help solve the health care deficit. These few things would make health care and higher education whole, and we would be in a better place to talk about real tax reform, including tax cuts, deductions, exemptions, rebates, all in January. And we'll be able to work through the other options to fill major needs like the gasoline tax for infrastructure or even collecting taxes on internet sales, which helps both the state and local governments. It doesn't seem that complicated, but it requires 
tough-minded leadership and a focus on what is best for the state, for the state and its people at this time. We cannot afford to fall any further behind. From North Louisiana to Acadiana and New Orleans, small business owners, teachers, students, we're all frustrated, especially since some of the things we should be doing are total no-brainers with both conservative, middle-of-the-road, and liberal advocates. Easy stuff that could happen tomorrow if there was political will and leadership. The most obvious of these, to talk about in a little bit more detail, is the Medicaid expansion. Now, I know some people want to make this a partisan issue, but it is not. The governor should expand Medicaid today. Look across the country at what other Republican governors who are conservative are doing relating to Medicaid. Look at Arkansas, look at Kentucky, look at Ohio. All conservative states that have found a market approach to expanding Medicaid. In the states that have accepted Medicaid, the number of uninsured is down dramatically. State spending compensating hospitals for expensive trips to the ER and other services is down. Nationally, growth in medical spending is down. In Arkansas, premiums are down at least 2%, while next door in Louisiana, premiums are up, in some cases, by nearly 20%. In Kentucky, the actuarial first firm, Price Waterhouse Coopers, worked with the University of Louisville to crunch the numbers. In that state, expansion will have a $15.6 billion economic impact and create, because job creation is our gold standard, 17,000 new jobs. In Arkansas, 8,500 new jobs. In Ohio, 27,000 new jobs. For every dollar these states invest, they get $20 back. Now I want you all to think about this. This is a good investment. This is like getting a $10 roast beef pole bar from Parkway Bakery for around a buck, <laughs> right? This is like getting beignets at Cafe Du Monde that usually cost $3 for 50 cents. How about a $3 pound of crawfish for 30 cents or a little bit of boudin for next to nothing? Think about it. But for conservative Ohio Republican and soon to be presidential candidate John Casey, the decision was rooted in his faith. The Ohio governor is passionate about this and he often points to Matthew 25. Quote, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me as you did it to one of the least of my brothers. So you did it to me. Close quote. Meanwhile, in Louisiana, another $235 million in state health care costs would potentially close emergency rooms in Baton Rouge. In New Orleans, we're looking at an $87 million shortfall in what we need to run the University Medical Center, and the LSU school has warned of bankruptcy. But still, we leave $16 billion in Medicaid expansion on the table. Ladies and gentlemen, this is really frustrating. I want 362,000 Louisianans to get access to life-giving health care. I want 18,400 Louisianans with mental illness to get the care they need. This will help them. It will protect public safety and will likely reduce prison costs. I want the $1.8 billion in increased economic activity and the 15,600 jobs across all sectors that would, be that would be created if Louisiana did expand Medicaid. I want to invest on the front end to save on the back end. And according to the governor's own Department of Health and Hospitals, the state could save as much as $367 million for Medicaid expansion. So, this should be obvious. This is not about handouts. Expanding Medicaid is good for the state as a whole. And the simple truth is that Medicaid expansion would help the people who are working but have jobs with little or no benefits. These are the salespeople, our child care providers, our bus and our taxi drivers, our food service and hotel employees, our musicians, our artists, our fishermen, our construction workers. Think about the construction workers rebuilding New Orleans, like the woman putting up the drywall at the University Medical Center, or the guy wiring the Sanchez Center in the Lower Ninth Ward. We need them healthy. We need them working on important projects. Or think about, if you will, our tourism and cultural <coughs> workforce that we thoroughly enjoy this weekend, that give us so much joy. If they aren't healthy, that means no musicians and no music on Frenchman Street, no art on Royal Street, no food in our restaurants, no tours of our famous cemeteries, no beautiful Mardi Gras floats, no jazz fest, no $11.2 billion Louisiana tourism industry. So from construction sites to music clubs, it's the same story. 
These working men and women of Louisiana are the folks that Medicaid expansion will help. But instead of our workers and our economy getting these benefits, all of the money that you, the citizens of Louisiana, pay in federal taxes is going for health care to pay for the citizens of Arkansas, Ohio, Kentucky, and every other state that did accept it. Now, I can't tell if this is a sick joke or it's just a nightmare. And it's time for the same thing relating to the high standards of Common Core and funding for our colleges and universities. I hope that we can wake up from this terrible dream. For Common Core, I agree with Governor Jeb Bush, who just endorsed Senator Vitter for governor. Our kids can compete on the highest level. We should stop selling them short. Change the name if you have to. But let's not subject our kids to low expectations and to low standards. In New Orleans, our, sec our success has been based on creating a system of choice, a system of accountability, a system of excellence with high standards for all. Let's not turn back the clock. We have to compete with kids from California, Florida, Boston, New York, China, and India. Our kids are up to it. Raise the bar. Make our kids work harder. Think more deeply. They will be better for it. In fact, it will give them the tools they need to compete in the 21st century knowledge-based economy because that is where the game will be won or lost. For funding higher education, I agree with the Republican Governor Brian Sandoval from Nevada. Funding for higher education should always be a top priority. We cannot cut our way to academic excellence. Increasing tuition or fees is just a hidden tax. And having our young people pay more and get less is not a recipe for success. Nevada is not exactly a bastion of liberalism, but the following has been proposed by that conservative Republican governor. Spending on higher education is up 9% to $1.1 billion. Spending on pre-K education up $782 million. And here's the kicker, $520 million for K-12 through from a new 40 cent increase in the cigarette tax and a new business license fee. Meanwhile, in our great state of Louisiana, Governor Foster began investing in higher education, which was continued by Governor Blanco. Bipartisanship over many, many, many years. When Governor Blanco left office, higher education was funded at the Southern average. Fast forward today, per pupil funding has been cut by 42%, and LSU, our flagship institution, is preparing paperwork right now to file the equivalency of academic bankruptcy. Did anybody in this room ever think that they would see that day? Soon I worry our colleges and universities may look more like online schools with big football stadiums than world-class institutions of higher education. Our kids deserve better. Louisiana needs better. Indeed, the proposed cuts would be especially devastating for the city of New Orleans. It is hard to see how the University of New Orleans could remain viable if the governor's proposal comes to pass and the state general fund allocation goes from nearly $29 million to just over $5 million. It's the same for Delgado, which may lose all but $5 million in that $25 million funding. Suno is in the same boat, facing an 82% cut. New Orleans needs these institutions and so does Louisiana, to prepare people for the jobs that we are creating and recruiting from firms like GE Capital, and here in Baton Rouge, IBM, which has already partnered GE with UNO so they can make the workers available that GE needs for the 300 jobs that they're creating that are paying in excess of $100,000. Who knows if this partnership can continue if these cuts are implemented? Over the years, the state's red blue and purple. From Texas to California, all right, investments in higher education made a generation ago have paid dividends many, many, many times over. Indeed, in North Carolina, because of key investments starting in the 1970s, the percentage of adults with a bachelor's degree increased 10 points faster than the national average. And today, institutions of higher education attract top young talent from across the globe and contribute $60 billion to the state's economy and pull over $1.2 billion in research grants. So here's the point. Today's businesses can go anywhere in the world to find skilled, well-educated, healthy workers they need. Skilled, well-educated, healthy. Places with a lot of these folks 
are going to thrive. The places without them will struggle to grow. Telling IBM, Walmart, and GE to take a hike is not a great job creation strategy. So to create good jobs in the 21st century, it's all about investing in our people, big time in human capital. That is why we need the thousands of people on Team Louisiana to be well-educated and healthy because we're going up against competition from Texas to Taiwan. So for higher education funding, rigorous pre-K, Medicaid expansion, the pathway is really clear. And quite frankly, it's not that hard. But the governor almost, but the next governor, also must come into office with a thoughtful, specific philosophy that can serve as a North Star for every issue. In our city, we have the new New Orleans way. And every decision, everything fits within that framework where we bring people together, we make tough decisions, we don't leave anybody behind, we cut, we reorganize, and we invest the savings in what matter most. So I would ask the candidates that are running for governor, what is their philosophy? What is their approach to governing? What are the answers to the tough questions about how Louisiana will protect her land, her people, and her finances? And we should not be content just with generalities or ideological platitudes. If they want to call a special session after inauguration, which I would strongly <coughs> advise them to do immediately, what would they specifically hope to accomplish and why? If they say that they are fiscal conservatives, tell me how you're going to be fiscally responsible. How are you going to structurally balance the budget for the long term, refill the depleted trust funds, and not completely destroy the state's ability to function and remain economically competitive? If you want to ensure our kids can succeed, how are they going to create a pathway to prosperity for every child that goes from pre-college to a job? If they're worried about income inequality, what's their plan to expand the earned income tax credit or raise the absurdly low minimum wage, where even someone working full-time still is stuck in poverty. If they want to make Louisiana quote unquote strong, what will they do to make health care and higher education accessible so that we can build the human capacity and the human <clears throat> capability that's so necessary to do that? If they want to repeal the inventory tax, specifically how will they prevent a big tax increase on property owners and make sure local governments can pay for levies, for schools, and public safety? If they want to save the coast, they want to save our land. How are they going to approach the oil and gas industry and bring everyone to the table to secure permanent and sufficient funding to restore our coast? How will they ensure our way of life with sustainable drilling today and for generations to come? And how will they respond to and deal with climate change? How will they live up to President Theodore Roosevelt's when he wrote, quote, it's not what we have that will make us a great nation. It is the way in which we use it. What is the broader vision for protecting the land, the people, and the budget? We have the new New Orleans way. What is your way? Specifics, not generalities or platitudes. Problem solving, not rigid ideology. Basic questions we should all ask. Now we have major challenges ahead. There's no doubt about it. And what happens this legislative session in the next governor's race has a profound impact on keeping the hard-won momentum going hard one momentum going in New Orleans. This is about the future of the place that all of us in this room call home, getting back on track and finding our balance again. There is no point in cursing the darkness when you can light a candle. We've got to fix it. We can find a way to do it. There are clearly solutions to these problems. Through the new New Orleans way, we have created a remarkable blueprint that the whole state can follow. We're bound together. As I said earlier, we have one shared destiny. So we have to go forward hand in hand, or we're not going to be able to go forward at all. We have to keep pressing on. We have to keep working together. We have to keep moving our communities forward, fighting back against those who prefer smoke and mirrors and putting off of tomorrow what should be done today. I have an abiding and a deep faith and full confidence that we can turn this around. For the city of New Orleans to reach her full potential by our 300th anniversary in 2018, the legislature and the state need to do their part. The people of New Orleans are counting on it. As mayor, I'm going to make sure that our voice is heard. New Orleans and Louisiana are worth fighting for. Thank you very much.